Chapter 3 What to Do When You Feel Worthless One Tuesday morning, a young woman came into my office for counseling. Wiping away her tears, she confessed, I am struggling in my relationship with God. I nodded in empathy and encouragement. Then I asked her, Why do you think it is such a struggle? She responded, I just feel like God is irritated and frustrated with me. I have deep doubts that God even loves me. How has God made it clear to you that he feels such frustration toward you? I asked. There was an awkward pause for a moment as she struggled to answer. After what felt like a long time, she finally ended up saying, Well, God did not make it clear to me. It is just the way that I feel. Ah, I see. Tell me a little more about how you feel about you. She took a deep breath and looked at the floor of my office. I am having such a hard time forgiving myself. I confess my sin and receive forgiveness, but then I fall into the same sin patterns again. Gently I asked her, Do you think you might be lumping together what God feels about you with how you feel about you? The Problem we project our feelings onto God. This young woman was not alone in her struggle to believe that God really loved her. I have seen multiple versions of this story play out over the years in my pastoral counseling. This process is called projection. People assume that God is deeply disappointed or frustrated with them because they are deeply disappointed or frustrated with themselves. It is important for us to check our assumptions instead of projecting them. Discouragement is like a pair of sunglasses that makes all of life seem darker. When we are discouraged, we often take our unflattering personal reflections and transfer those dark thoughts and feelings to God. We make the faulty assumption that God must look at me the way I look at me. Take a moment and examine your self-talk or your inner dialogue. What kinds of things do you say to yourself on a regular basis? Consider whether your self-talk includes negative statements, such as, I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm just going to fail anyway. Why try? I'll never be able to do this. I'm a loser. No one will ever love me. I am still shocked by my own self-talk. I speak very harshly to myself, saying things that I would never say to anyone else. We need to lay down the weapons that we aim at ourselves and check our stories against God's story. The Solution. Check the Story. We can either project onto God what we think about ourselves, or we can receive from God what He says about us. Revelation is the opposite of projection. The process looks something like this. Revelation is God unto us. Projection is us unto God. The opposite of projecting what we think about ourselves onto God is receiving what He says about us from God. We will get our stories wrong and become discouraged every time, unless we let God be the narrator. Where do we go to check our misguided beliefs and hear God's version? The full story can be found in God's Word. Let's pause for a moment and think through why it can be so spiritually stirring and life-giving to read what God says in His Word. What does it mean when we say the Bible is God's Word? The Apostle Paul provides what is perhaps the clearest answer to this question. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says, All Scripture is breathed out by God. Many Scripture versions translate the word for breathed out in the Greek text as inspired, but it actually means expired, not as in having reached its expiration date, but as in physically breathing out. This description offers a profoundly powerful picture of what the Bible is. It is the very breath of God. This process is similar to the way God created Adam. The Bible says that on the sixth day, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. In the Garden of Eden, God breathed out the breath of life, and that breath went into the dust, and the man became alive. As with Adam, God breathed life into the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. How can we receive God's life-giving breath today? We open God's Word and breathe it in.
the story of your salvation. The breathed-out words of the Bible tell us the true story of how God made us alive. Yet there are many counterfeit versions of our story that we can tell ourselves. For example, I sometimes hear people bemoan that their testimony is boring. They say that they were raised in a Christian home and are not quite sure when they got saved. They were nurtured in the truth of the gospel from an early age and have not openly rebelled in a lawless kind of way. Prior to coming to Christ, they were never arrested for a crime, they were never addicted to drugs, and they never slept around. Therefore, they think their testimony of coming to faith in Jesus is boring because they never lived a wild and reckless life. Perhaps your testimony is something like that. If so, you may have avoided a list of notorious sins, but that doesn't mean that your salvation is boring. You have believed a half-truth. People who think that salvation is boring do not really know their story. Everything changes when we allow God to tell our story. Look at the way he shares it in his word. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. In God's version of the story, no one has a boring testimony for one simple reason. Being raised from the dead is not boring. You may feel like a mess or a failure, but that is only a half-truth. The full story shows that you are a God-wrought miracle. Don't water down the beauty of salvation. It is not as if you were on the brink of drowning and then God threw a life preserver with salvation printed in red letters within your reach so that if you would just grab it, he could pull you in. Not at all. In God's version of the story, you were dead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5. You were not drowning and almost dead. You had already drowned and were stone cold dead at the bottom of the lake as a child of wrath. God had to make you alive. He dove to the bottom of the lake, pulled your dead body up to the shore, breathed the breath of life into you, performing the miracle of divine mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and made you alive. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 Salvation is not merely the offer of life, but the giving of life. Christianity is not about bad people becoming better, it is about dead people becoming alive. You are not boring, you are not a mess, you are a miracle. Why did God save us and give us new life? This text answers that question with bold clarity that heralds God's heart. Because of the great love with which he loved us. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4. God did not love us because we were lovely. He loved us because God is love and he chose us as his children. The same dynamic of our salvation being a result of God's love appears in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verses 7 through 8. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He set his love on you because he loves you. Are you trying to make yourself perfect to earn his love? If so, you are living the wrong story. The true story says that you are alive because God first loved you. The Story of God's Love The reason that God's unconditional love is so hard to grasp is that human love operates on such a different wavelength. Human love is a reaction of attraction. It starts with a person's loveliness, which leads to the response of love. In other words, human love sets its love on that which is already lovely. The divine love of the Father is gloriously different. God does not look around to find the best people to love because they are already good. God's perfectly pure eyes would not find any moral loveliness among the mass of sinful humanity. But do not fall into the trap of thinking that God the Father is the angry member of the Trinity, 
and Jesus is the loving one who has to keep the Father in check. Try this theological quiz on for size. I will make two statements, and you will determine whether they are true. One, God loves us because Christ died for us. That statement can be misleading because it does not factor in the Father's love that led him to send the Son. John chapter 3, verse 16 declares, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Without the love of God the Father, there would be no sending of the Son to save us from our own shortcomings. When we factor in the love of the Father, we can then affirm the truth of the second statement. 2. Because God loves us, Christ died for us. God loved us before he sent his Son to earth. The love of the Father came before the cross of Christ, and it was his love for us that led him to send his Son to die for us so that we could be reunited one day. We see the love of God in sending his Son to save us from our sinfulness so that we could become his children. We can say with the Apostle John, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 The Holy Spirit Spotlights the Story Whenever we are tempted to become discouraged, we should check to make sure we have our story straight. In Christ, we are children of God. As children of God, we are the objects of God's love not because of anything we have done, but because He chose to love us. This is our story. The Holy Spirit brings the story of God's love home to our hearts. How? The Holy Spirit does not draw attention to Himself. He has been called the shy member of the Trinity because the Spirit does not reveal Himself. He reveals Christ. I love how J.I. Packer makes this point in Keep in Step with the Spirit. I remember walking to church one winter evening to preach on the words, He shall glorify me, seeing the building floodlit as I turned a corner, and realizing that this was exactly the illustration my message needed. When floodlighting is well done, the floodlights are so placed that you do not see them. You are not, in fact, supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you are meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intended effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness, and to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you can see it properly. This perfectly illustrates the Spirit's new covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on the Savior. Or think of it this way. It is as if the Spirit stands behind us, throwing light over our shoulder, on Jesus, who stands facing us. The Spirit's message to us is never, Look at me. Listen to me. Come to me. Get to know me. But always, look at Him and see His glory. Listen to Him and hear His word. Go to Him and have His life. Get to know Him and taste His gift of joy and peace. The Holy Spirit shows us Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. John chapter 14, verse 6. He reveals the Father to us so clearly that if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. And Jesus gives us the right to become children of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. The Holy Spirit is profoundly active in making sure that this message of God's love penetrates our defenses. To shine a spotlight on the story, God gives us a double testimony, an external, objective testimony, and an internal, subjective one. The External Testimony of the Spirit God has provided an external testimony of His love through the Bible. The Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. Peter explains the process of writing the Bible this way. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Scripture is God's personal revelation of His love for us. Perhaps you struggle to feel the fact of God's love, 
Does your lack of feeling make God's love any less real? The Bible points us to the external testimony of God's love found in the cross of Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Remember, God did not love you and me because we were lovely. He loved us while we were still sinners, morally unlovely. Whenever you feel the talons of discouragement sinking into your heart, look to the cross and see the unchanging, unshakable, irreversible love of God as Jesus bore the burden of sin for you and suffered in your place. He was condemned so that you could be accepted. In Christ, the banner flying high over you says, No condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 The Internal Testimony of the Spirit God has also provided an internal testimony of His love through the Holy Spirit. Look at the connection between God's love, the Holy Spirit, and the hope in our hearts. Hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 On the one hand, God's love transcends our subjective doubts through the objective testimony that exists outside of us at the cross. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 On the other hand, God's love transcends cerebral calculation because God pours His love into our very hearts through His Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Adoption. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. The Spirit testifies with our spirits that we are the children of God, causing us to cry out, Father. There are orphanages throughout the world where it is common for babies and young children to be silent. Why? The children have learned that they could cry, but no one would answer. So they learned to stop reaching out. Andy Bilson, a British professor of social work, writes, Without doubt, the most gut-wrenching sound I've ever heard is that of silence, in a ward full of children in an orphanage. In orphanages throughout Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America, babies have learned not to cry because they realize no one will comfort them. They're ignored, forgotten, silent. In contrast, Christians can cry out because we know we have a Father who will answer. Paul describes our response to God's love in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 16. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of adoption. He testifies to our adoption into the family of God. In his classic book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer observed that we don't prize the doctrine of being adopted into God's family as we should, because it is usually lumped together with justification or the forgiveness of sins. Packer says that adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification, so how do we avoid lumping justification and adoption together? Justification means that even though we are guilty sinners, we can receive the verdict of not guilty on the basis of what Christ has done for us. Christ's life provided the righteousness we need, and Christ's death paid the penalty for our sins. Adoption is an over and above gift of belonging. We receive through justification by faith. Justification says, You are not guilty. Adoption says, you are family. Justification says, you can go free now. Adoption says, you can live here always. People who think of God only as a judge have a hard time feeling the full weight of the glory of salvation because it is hard to imagine having a deep relationship with a judge. But he is no longer only our judge. He is our loving father as well. There is a kind of love on display here that should feel lavish and unique. Through the miracle of adoption, we go through a mind-blowing transformation. Those who were children of wrath are now children of God. The Apostle John writes with such a sense of wonder and worship that it seems like he almost falls out of his chair while writing this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us 
that we should be called children of God, and so we are. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. We are the children of God. That is our story. Can you believe it? Hope for the unreached places in your heart. As we saw earlier, we often think that God is frustrated with us because we are frustrated with ourselves. Deep down, we think that God merely tolerates us. We think, how could He really and truly love us? This is where we need to hear the truth of God's Word, herald His heart for His children, rather than listen to the lies and half-truths of our discouraged hearts. One of the most stunning promises in the Bible is that God will never stop loving His children. God's I will leads to a that they. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 39 through 41. Show me a chapter and verse in God's Word that says His love for His children is half-hearted. Look again at what God explicitly says. He loves you and rejoices in doing good for you with all His heart and all His soul. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41. This seems too good to be true. Have you ever seen someone do something with every ounce of passion and emotion they could muster? No one ever sees that kind of passion and says, I wonder if their heart is in it. Imagine what someone could do with an infinite, unlimited heart and unlimited soul. We won't get to heaven because we love God with all our hearts and souls. We will make it to heaven because God loves us with all of his heart and soul. Do you understand that deeply and viscerally? There are places in our hearts where discouragement has permanently dispossessed hope, but the love of God gives us a mission of hope in our hearts. We all know that there are unreached peoples in this world who need to be reached with the gospel, but there are also unreached places in our hearts that still need to be reached with the gospel. Few of us struggle to believe that God sees every part of our hearts, because that reality is fairly easy for us to grasp. The greater struggle comes when we are called to believe that God sees every sin in our hearts and yet still loves us with all of His heart. If you are feeling discouraged and beginning to lose heart, I urge you to confront your unbelief. Let God's words in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 41 herald God's heart to you. I will rejoice in doing them good, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. God doesn't merely tolerate you, and He does not love you with half His heart. Instead, He loves you with all of His infinite heart and soul. Let the unreached places in your heart hope again.